Oh, here I am, please, Rebecca. Okay, we are now recording. Welcome, everyone. My name is Canon Kristen White, and I serve as Canon to the Ordinary for Congregational Developments and Leadership on Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs' staff. I am grateful to welcome Rebecca Sims as our tech person who is making all the technology work tonight and is amazing. And so she's going to help us uh, make sure that all of the pieces fit together during our time together tonight. Um, I would like to begin with prayer and then we will get started. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, in Holy Scripture, you teach us that when we welcome strangers, we may well be welcoming angels unawares. Help us to live into our call as diocese, to, to extend a generous invitation and welcome, trusting that as we welcome the members of the body that is the church, as we welcome neighbors from our communities, as we welcome the stranger, to our door that we are welcoming you so help us to do that well and with kindness and generosity trusting that you are present with us that you are the one we receive and that we are always and ever enfolded in your amazing grace in jesus name we pray amen I am going to start sharing my screen uh, so that you all can see. Oh, actually, I'm going to back it up just a second first to the beginning. Okay, now I will be sharing the screen. Okay, can you all see the first slide of my screen now? All right. What I would ask you all to do at this point is to enter into the chat your name. And, well, your name actually will be in there, but um, one reason why you chose to come to this conversation tonight. So you all have plenty of options for ways that you could spend a Wednesday night, and I would love to know a little bit more about what brought you here to us our time together. And if it's a question, please enter that question. And I'm hoping that we will be able to circle back around and take a look at those questions by the time that we are done. And see what we have learned in that time together. So one thing you hope to learn and one question you have, or one question that you have about our time. Okay. So as you can see here, this workshop is called Gathering the Body of Christ During Pandemic. Um, and I just want to take a look here. I think um, one of the great things about our knowing our kind of source is um, checking back always and regularly with our mission. And this week for our pre-convention workshops, we are looking at the second of our five pillars of mission, which is to offer a generous invitation and welcome. And so um, I'm going to take a look at the chat before we go any farther and see what folks are, have, what has brought you to us tonight. So I'm seeing knowledge and understanding about how the diocese works, spiritual challenge. Valeria is looking for a follow on to the CCD workshop. I'm hoping that's exactly what you find tonight. Um, Evelyn wondering, how do we do this? How do we extend a welcome when we can't gather in person? Uh, <laughs> Deacon Kathy, how to welcome in Zoom land, something we're all trying to get better at these days. Debbie, how to be welcoming when we are apart from each other. 
um, Rebecca here because St. Timothy's is revitalizing and looking how, at how to welcome guests, which is happening. I will tell you, it's happening. I'm hearing stories from around the diocese. Fatima wants to hear and learn on how we can become better at welcoming at this time in isolation. So I'm hearing a lot about isolation, I'm hearing a lot about how do we do this well in this very strange time. Um, Zoom land is fantastic. <laughs> um, and again, so how, how do we do the thing that we feel called to do as church at a time when things don't look like everything that we've been accustomed to over the course of our lives? So I want to pause there for just a second. And I want you to think now about a time when you were welcomed well. And it may have been in a church situation. It may not have been in a church situation. But I'm going to stop sharing for this moment and bring us back to each other and ask Rebecca to get us ready to go into groups of four. And I'm going to ask that when you go into your small group breakouts, that you share that, and please share the time equally. We've got eight minutes all together. We're gonna to have people ideally in groups of four, but think about a time when you knew that you had been welcomed well by someone else, okay? And Rebecca, can you put people into groups? Sure, um, and Ken, Kristen, just don't accept the invite that you're gonna get. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Everyone else. Everyone else, else. please extend the gener please accept the generous invitation. <laughs> we'll see you in eight minutes, everybody. <laughs> All right, I'm setting my timer. Oh great, thank you. Oh, Tom's from St. John. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Okay. And can you pause the recording? Yes. Else. But please put into the chat anything that stood out to you from those from those conversations that you just had. There were things that that were that that kind of marked it for you. Somebody's story stood out. If there was something particularly special that you noticed or a consistency among people's stories. Please add those to the chat. And we're going to keep going here. Uh, so as you all know, our, our diocesan mission, which came um, in the course of 10 conversations um, in, early in Bishop Jennifer's time serving as your bishop, um, the second of those five pillars is to offer a generous invitation and welcome. And given the time that we are in, we certainly face our challenges, but I think it's important for us to go back to the core of what we're called to do and be as church. So, and it feels important in that to ground ourselves in scripture. Um, you'll see here, this is actually uh, from the rule of St. Benedict, um, and which itself also finds its foundation in scripture. All guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ, for he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. So that is the passage of scripture that I thought of when I started thinking about um, our time together this evening. And just to kind of find our foundation, both in our mission and in the scripture that, that we inhabit, that, that this is our call as Christians uh, to live into. So, um, this material also comes from, as I've talked about with several of you, and some of you took part in the two-day offering that we had at the College for Congregational Development. It is based in the model that we refer to as Gather, Transform, Send. And if any of you watched the, uh, the preparatory video beforehand, this is what one of the core models of the College for Congregational Development. And we refer to this model as sort of giving us a lens into the essential work of the church, that what we're called to do together is to gather ourselves together as church, as people who are already members of the body of Christ, that is our church, and those who would join us 
and cultivate a place in which God can transform our lives. And so that's that piece of transformation. After the body is gathered, then we are transformed. And it is not our work to do that transformation. It is God's work. But we can certainly cultivate space that makes it a rich opportunity for that to happen. And then we are sent out into the world and specifically out into our context, um, which varies greatly and certainly, as we all know, has varied a lot in this time. Sent out to be light and leaven to the world. So that is the full model that we're talking about. But for the purposes of tonight's gathering, we're going to be really focused on this, on this gathering piece itself, okay? But just please, as we're finding our way through this conversation tonight, please keep in mind that we are not only talking about newcomers. Everybody, we're not just talking about visitors. All of us as church are called to be gathered over and over again into the body of Christ that is the church. So what does that mean? <laughs> Here's some ideas from the before times <laughs> when we could all be breathing the same air together. And, you know, these are the things, this is what we knew how to do um, before we were faced with the situation that we are in now. This was at a protest at St. John's Church about a year and a half ago. Um, and with all those folks together, it seems like a long time ago right now. Um, but there are four constituent pieces to this model. So four parts that help us to sort of fully embody what it is to gather as church. So the first one of those under this model is to invite. And so we draw attention to Christ and the church. And when we are inviting people into the life of the church, that's basically everything that happens before somebody's foot crosses the threshold, either literally or figuratively. So what you'll see here is uh, a picture of about 200 of us marching in the Pride Parade in 2019. Um, certainly, I would say, drawing attention to Christ and the church in that moment, telling everybody who was there, God loves you, no exceptions. That doesn't always only have to happen through a parade, though. That is also everything from what our website looks like, um, what the signage on the church looks like, uh, what the word of mouth about your congregation is in the community. Um, if somebody is personally invited to church, I will say, um, it's going back to talking about newcomers, our statistics are that 85% of people who come to a church for the first time come because someone they know invited them. So, but all of those things, if you think about the invite portion of gathering as everything that, um, that, that uh, any, any way that people are connected to the church before they actual come, actually come to the church or take part in the church is the invite portion. And then greet is what happens when they get there. So we have Father Davies Reed of St. Francis Zionsville greeting a puppy and that dog's owner at the St. Francis celebration. So last year, again, no masks there. What we do when we greet as church is we recognize and offer appropriate and helpful hospitality to guests in our midst. So I would invite you in the chat in this moment to think about some ways that we could greet that are not necessarily appropriate or helpful. <laughs> Think about that. Um, you know, this is probably not a moment when somebody comes to our church for the first time. We don't want to, in that moment, give them a pledge card <laughs> or ask them to take over the youth group, um, but really, or, or be desperate. But really what we're trying to do in that moment is to help people feel welcome um, within the church that we are trying to extend hospitality um, from. Okay. The third part of, of gathering is how we orient people. So this is the thing that as church we do to help people take part in the life of the church. So if you imagine in normal times, again, somebody finds their way, you know, hears about your church, finds their way to your church one way or the other, maybe on Sunday, maybe in some other circumstance, um, is, is, is greeted when they get there. 
And then like to help them really feel like they're a part of it, they're gonna no need to know how to take part. So this is a scene from um, a, a picture from the um, Holy Conversations that took place at Christ Church Cathedral last year. So where people were talking about, these are the things that we do together that matter as church. So that's a really important way for people within the congregation to know how they can take part within that community of faith. And the fourth and final part of this whole process is incorporating. And this is the piece in which the congregation, the leaders of the congregation help people begin to feel like your church is their church, like they belong and they are a part. Okay. I'm gonna stop screen sharing for just a second and bring us all back together and say, does anybody have any questions? Does this all make sense so far as we're talking about gather, being inclusive of invite, greet, orient, and incorporate? Does that all make sense? Does anybody have any questions about those things so far? Okay. So, as we know from the last seven months, however, we are not in normal times. We're in rather extraordinary times, right? So what do we do now? <laughs> so this is an image from um, the screen during the College for Congregational Development earlier this summer, um, which was uh, my small group from the CCD training, or one of the small groups um, from the CCD training. Um, and that we are in a completely different context. So if you'll remember from the Gather, Transform, Send model, the three pieces were that we are gathered into the body of Christ, we create a place in which we, we trust that we have cultivated an environment where God's transformation is not inhibited, and then we are sent out into the world as light and leaven, but sent out into the world within our context. And our context over these last seven months is completely different than everything that we've known before now. So we've had to figure out some other ways of doing things, right? Even so, our mission continues. So we are still called as church to live into our core purpose, to offer a generous welcome to members, to visitors, the people in our neighborhoods and the people within our communities, and to gather the body of Christ. This is not something that we can wait six months, eight months, a year. To, we, we cannot stop being who we are called to be as church. And so even with uh, the difficulty of trying to figure out how to do this thing in this new way that none of us got degrees in, or very few of us probably got degrees in, um, that is not familiar to us, even so, we are still called to live our mission. And so we have to get, we have to get creative about that, and particularly to be looking at our context in this moment, okay? So here's some examples of how I have seen that happening in this diocese since March. So uh, uh, this picture was actually taken on Pentecost um, when we were gathering downtown for the protest and um, the procession from, um, from the circle out to the city county government building to protest um, George Floyd's death. So we were in that moment gathering at our cathedral and processing together as people of faith and seeking in that moment to draw attention to Christ and the church. One of the questions that we all can be thinking in this moment is how would somebody who doesn't already belong to your church know that your congregation exists? So when we think about this invite piece, what we're seeking to do is help people know that we're here, and those people may already be part of your congregation. Another piece of what is happening, we're finding that we have to gather ourselves, continue to gather the congregation that already exists, and be hospitable to people who may not be part of our church. We are facing right now a time that, I mean, 
it feels tired to say that it's unprecedented, but I don't have a better word for that in this moment. And there are people, I know, there are people who are reaching out who are lonely, who are isolated, who are trying to make sense of a world that does not make sense right now, and who need community. And so there are churches that are, that are finding newcomers, even now, <laughs> even with all the limitations that we face in not being able to gather as we have been accustomed to gathering. So take a minute and give some thought to how would somebody who either is already a part of your church but feels lonely and isolated, how would they be invited back in? How would they be invited to take part? Maybe the technology is not familiar. Maybe they don't like being on screens. How might they be invited and drawn back into the church of which they are a part? And then conversely, how would people who are not a part of your church, but who are lonely and scared, and again, trying to make sense of a world that doesn't make sense, and seeking community at a time when that's really hard to find, how would they even know that your church exists? That's an important question, I think, for all of us to ask. How would they find your church? So imagine you're a newcomer. Imagine you're somebody new to your hometown, and they're trying to find community, and they've moved during pandemic. How would they find your church if they wanted to take part? We don't have yellow pages anymore. We have websites. Um, so does your website point someone to how they could take part in church with you on Sunday? How would they, if they were to walk past your church, how would they know that they were welcome? How would they know that it was something that they could be a part of as well? How would they know how to get registered? How would they know how, what time the church service is and where? Is it in a normal location? Is it in a really visible location if you're gathering outside for worship? Is it out on the front lawn that everybody's going to see? Or is it often kind of a field that's tucked behind something? Or is it at a local park? So think about those ways. And there's, you know, there's always ways that we can do this better. But I just would invite you in this moment to take a second and think about what's one way that you at your church, through your church, through your website, through word of mouth, through personal invitations, through something physically on your property, how might you let your community know that your church is here to love them and to offer them a generous invitation and welcome? So please, let's just pause there for a minute and please put your, your thoughts into the chat. Hey, sign, the sign, um, St. Tim's has an outdoor sign that has the website. Somebody left a visitor accidentally in charge of the nursery. <laughs> I was at a church once where parents were dropping off their kids and the, and the teacher said, oh, could you please stay and teach? <laughs> oh, outside worship is visible from the road. That's a great thing to be able to do. Your, kind of, your community knows that you are there. Outdoor signs and banners that say love lives that love lives here. You could change your yard sign to invite neighbors through Facebook. Facebook is also another great way to let people know that your church is there and that you want them to take part. You want them to participate. Ooh, great idea. Business cards with church information, current services outside on the lawn, website and Facebook page. A garden and a sign, the website visible on the property. Those are all really good things. Yeah, in fact, uh, Joan, I drive past St. Albans when I take my daughter to work, and I saw your sign a couple of weeks ago when I took her there. Outdoor sign, the time and the website. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and that's, you know, there's um, the, the whole piece of, there, I hear a lot of stories about communities where people don't know that there's an Episcopal church in town. That's, 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 and that's helpful to know because then you can do something about it. Plenty of signage, but um, Kathy, what a beautiful thing to go in clericals to everybody's house and do a portrait. That is a beautiful example of gathering the people who are already part of your church, right? That we are all called to be gathered together as the body of Christ. And part of what's beautiful about this invite piece is helping your church feel porous. So the people who are already part of the congregation feel like they are within the congregation. 
and then that, that there are ways for new people to join in. Like if you think about a boundary, you don't want it to be so hard that people can't get inside of it, right? But there has to be a containing as well. So, so it's important to be thinking about those things. Thank you all for sharing. Thanks for sharing that information. Okay, so we know a little something about inviting, even in our context, even during this time of pandemic. So what does it mean to greet? So think about, think about those moments when somebody gets to your church. If so, say you're gathering outside. This is a scene from the Facebook page, actually, from Trinity Indianapolis. Um, appropriate to uh, recognize and offer appropriate and helpful hospitality to guests in our midst. So here is appropriate and helpful hospitality in that people are being fed at church. They're receiving the body of Christ. So give some thought to what it's like. And one of the things that I have found myself, I, I, a little bit of background, um, I grew up in the Episcopal Church and my dad's a priest. And so I have never not known, I've always known the church as my home. And one of the things that I discovered when I got to seminary is um, that I had never had to choose a church before then, right? Because I'd always gone to the church that I'd grown up in where my dad was the priest. And so um, it was a really interesting thing to, for the first time in my life, not be an insider, right? Because people had always known who I was. I had never had to introduce myself. I had never had to think about, is this church a fit for me or is it not? But all of a sudden, I had to start thinking about, where do I park? Which door do I go inside? Now, this is again in normal times, but which door do I go inside? As we start with regathering plans, churches have been very thoughtful to think about, okay, if we have capacity for 25 people in our building, how many seats are we going to reserve no matter what for visitors? That shows that you're anticipating that there will be visitors. Okay, wonderful. We haven't seen each other in person for months and months and months. So somebody shows up and they're a visitor, is our energy going as much to those new people in our midst as it is to those people that we have missed as family for these past months? So that's, I mean, there are all kinds of things for us to be thinking about. It's important to think about things like how are people treated differently if they are coming together as part of a family versus a single person? So how are people, how do we receive people to show that everyone is beloved and welcome as a member of the body of Christ that is this church? Think about things like, what do announcements feel like? That can be, especially in smaller churches, and many Episcopal churches are smaller churches, but even not, I mean, not necessarily limited to that. When it comes time for announcements, is the person offering the announcements assuming that everybody who's in the congregation knows what they're talking about? And if that's the case, what's that like for somebody who may be a visitor? Okay. How do you find out? So all of these questions are important. And so it might be a necessary thing to just go through an exercise on your own of thinking about, okay, if I pulled into our parking lot, how would I know where to park? Which door would I go inside? Episcopal churches are famous for having 17 doors and only one of them is unlocked. So how is somebody supposed to know that? Episcopal churches are also frequently difficult for people with um, handicap abilities who have, who, are, who have limited mobility to be able to get inside. And so how can we make sure that we are um, able to greet and welcome people well? Okay. So somebody has been invited, they have been greeted. Now, how do they know how to take part? Um, this is, as you can see from All Saints in Indianapolis, on their website, one of the choices that you can see from the drop-down menu is COVID-19, Church in the Time of Coronavirus, what we're doing for now. And if you click there, you go to their regathering plan and you can find out what's happening right now. One of the things that we have discovered in the life of the Episcopal Church and in you know, our lives all together right now is that um, we are having to adapt quickly. And I will say as somebody who is um, helping to write and revise and revise and revise and revise the regathering plans as we get more information, all of us are in a period of learning right now. 
And so how do people who want to take part in your place find out how to do that? And so there are as many ways as you can share kind of the boundaries of what we do and we don't do. If you are gathering for in-person worship, how do people know how to register? What do you do if you have, you know, I don't know, 27 people show up and you only have capacity to safely seat 22? What do you do if somebody shows up and we're all sitting outside and you're supposed to bring your own chair and they don't have a chair? Like, how can we think through ways to help people take part so that they are able to participate in the life of the church together with you? And how do we think through ways? I, I like to think of, of, the para, of the image of lowering the threshold. If you think about, particularly if somebody's coming to your church for the first time, all of the things that they have to do in order to get themselves there. They have to figure out where they're going. They have to find out what time the service is. They have to get there. They have to park. They have to wonder about whether they're wearing the right kinds of clothes that are gonna be appropriate for that circumstance. They have to get in the door. We have a very unique and beautiful and unique way of worshiping. So there's some stand up, there's some sit down, there's some when do people cross themselves, who kneels and why do you kneel and how do we do all that from a lawn chair if we're sitting outside and it's sort of uncomfortable, you know, like all of those things that people are trying to figure out how to participate and that's if they're new. Then think about what it's like for people who are already members of this body but who have known how to worship in the way that we used to worship. And we're not doing that anymore. And friends, I will tell you, we've had um, over the last three days, we have been in a clergy conference learning about change in the life of the church. And one of the things that is always true is that when we are going through a time of change, especially the kind of change that we're going through now, that there's grief with that. And so when people are having to figure out online church and we don't get to sing and we're only receiving the bread and not the wine, you know, all of those pieces, that's a lot of change. And so even for the people who are already part of your congregation, how can you help them be oriented so that they too, if this has been their church for 73 years, I would hope that it can continue to, they can continue to feel like part of the body of Christ that is this church. And so it's our work together to help orient them so that they can participate. Finally, incorporating. How we incorporate is helping people feel like their church is your church. And I was delighted to find this picture, which is taken from the Facebook page of Good Samaritan Church in Brownsburg, where they did this videotaping of what, what I trust will be their Christmas pageant. <laughs> and you can see the kids with the masks <laughs> and they had come and they'd very carefully prepared all of these different scenes so that, so that kids could participate in the church of which they are a part. So as you take a look at the, those little sweet faces, you, I, I would, I would, I would bet a dollar that all of those kids, if you ask them what their church was, they would say, good Sam's. This is the church to which they belong. And so how, have we, how has that church helped them to feel that way? Well, all of the different ways, all of the various steps, at one point or another, their families were greeted sometime within the last five years, because that's how long good Sam's has been a church. They were greeted, they were, they were invited, so they somehow, um, uh, there was attention drawn to Christ and the church. They were greeted appropriately and helpfully. They were oriented to the life of the church and now they are incorporated. And there are a number of marks of, of what this looks like, whether we're in a pandemic or not. Um, sh things that show us that someone has been incorporated into the life of the body of Christ, which is the church, are things like going through um, an orientation, you know, like a, like a Church 101, Episcopalians 101 process, that would be the orienting part. And then at the end of it, maybe being invited into um, 
a right of welcome. The first picture that we saw from all the pictures from with no mask from the before times where you see everybody kind of laying hands on the person in the in the center screen. Uh, I missed it. I should have talked about it earlier. That was at St. Matthew's Church and that was when uh, Father Ben Wyatt, who's the Pathways priest, was being welcomed as their priest. Um, and so the whole church gathered around and we prayed over him and we laid hands on him to welcome him on his first Sunday. That was a way of publicly recognizing that he was making that church his church during the time that he was serving as their Pathways priest. Um, I have gone through this in the, in, during the pandemic. Um, our family has chosen a home church and we had an online orientation class that I took part in and they had an online rite of welcome that was part of the liturgy. So there are certainly ways to do this online. We have to go back to thinking about what our core value is and how we can live it out in this time. Yeah. Other marks of someone being incorporated is when they begin to serve as a leader in your congregation. And there are ways of you know, equipping and helping people to live into those roles, even in a time of pandemic. When people are invited and choose to accept being confirmed or baptized or received, that's a way of them showing that your church is their church. Somebody accepts the invitation to make a financial pledge, again, that's a way of them signifying that I make this commitment to this church, which is now my church. I love seeing, and there's Rebecca, there's a picture of our diocesan convention from 2019, and I trust in the, in the hope that there will be a, t a time when we come back together as church as for our diocesan convention in person once again. And so someday we will be able to gather again like this. But until then, I would invite us to think about some good questions for us to ask. And each of these questions relate to one of those aspects of gathering. So in terms of inviting, how are we seeking people out and how are they finding us? I want to just pause there for a second and invite you to respond to that in the chat. How are you at your congregation? How are you seeking people out? And how are they finding you? Oh, I like that idea from Dave. Might be a good idea to have a helper for people. Yeah. Janet, downtown location. Absolutely, that's a great thing. Gorgeous gardens. What else? How are you seeking people out? Mainly people find us because of other members. That personal invitation, 85% of people come to new churches because someone has invited them. People looking for a more contemplative online experience. It's helpful to know that too. And again, it, I think this process um, asks of us to be curious, particularly in a situation where um, we have known church the way, to be the way we have known church for a long time. And now all of a sudden things are not as they have been. And so how can we get curious about what people's experience is? People from an hour away have contacted us because they're watching us online. That's wonderful. Ah, TJ, one person joins us online every Sunday because he found you on Google. That's great. So knowing those different ways that people find you is important. That's, that's helpful data. So knowing that your website will point people to the way that they can take part in your place. And I think in this time of pandemic, there are things that we are learning that we probably will need to continue even when we don't have to anymore. Ah, Louise, wearing your t-shirt, your St. Paul's t-shirt to public events. That's wonderful. People coming to the feeding program. Yes, in fact, this is a picture of St. Stephen's Terre Haute, their feeding program there. Mention your church when discussing how others are dealing with isolation. Absolutely. The second question here, how do we, oh, that should say, how do we, instead of how do we, how do we greet the folks who are with us in person or virtually? I know at St. Tim's, you all have a virtual verger, somebody who helps people find their way, get connected with the service, make sure that they have the information that they need, right? You know, at, at um, 
All Saints, that they have somebody both um, keeping track on the chat in Zoom and also it's broadcast to Facebook and there's somebody welcoming and hosting people over Facebook, making sure that any of the prayers that are entered in either place uh, get to the person who is facilitating that time. Ooh, Tom, you had a mask made with the church and name and logo. That's wonderful. That is really good information, Rebecca. Googling your church from a library or public computer to see whether it's possible to find you from a general search. People wearing their church t-shirts or hats or something out publicly. Um, I will say I'm thinking back to Ken and Stephanie Speller's presentation last week. Um, remember that we have to say the words too, uh, with that we can't just trust that having identification is something that people are going to are gonna ask us about. And so if somebody uh, comes to the conversation about what this, you know, why you're, why you're doing what you're doing, um, bringing the words of Jesus and hospitality into it is an important part. And that's uh, something for us to learn as Episcopalians. How do we help people know how to take part in our life of faith? So this is that question of orienting. So those are just some interesting things to be thinking about. Um, how would somebody, again, how would somebody know how to find your church online? And then how would they be greeted when they get there? And then how would they know where to find the bulletin and all of the different pieces or get connected with other members of the community? that would help orient them, not just to the worship, although worship is often one of the first places, but get oriented to the life of the community. Get oriented to, in this circumstance, maybe participating in the feeding program or something that, that, um, that matters in the life of your community, both within your congregation and in the life of your wider neighborhood. And then finally, that question of how can we help people feel like our church is their church. That's that final piece of no longer as a person, a visitor, but they've really become a part of the body of Christ that is your congregation. Pat, that's wonderful to make sure every guest gets a newsletter. I love the idea of creating online events, Zoom conversations. Um, I know All Saints had a presentation on the history of redlining in the city of Indianapolis last week. It's another really wonderful way to bring us into our history and help us know who we are as we are working to be beloved community. Okay, but I think um, within all of this, this question of how can we be curious and ensure that as church that we are asking good questions um, is always an important piece of things. Yes, thank you, Suzanne. The need to introduce a newer person to another longer member, longer, longer time member and intentionally invite them to meet online or in person. Um, it's important that, that, that the work of welcoming new members into your body does not belong solely to the clergy. Uh, it's really important for those relationships to be broadened. So again, the person can help feel like they belong to, I mean, it, it's wonderful to have a good relationship with a priest or a deacon and that those relationships need to broaden beyond just that single relationship. All right. Yes, um, Tom, thank you. Follow up with postal mail, email, phone calls. You know how rare it is to get a handwritten note in the actual mail anymore? It's pretty rare and pretty lovely. And I will tell you, when I receive a note that has been written and somebody took the time to put a stamp on it and put it in the mail and send it to me, I remember that. Um, at my last congregation, we had a team of folks who would, and it, and it was intended, I was, I was rector of a congregation in the Chicago area. And um, it was necessary that I not be the one who did. So I would, I would welcome people and invite them to coffee. But then we had a team of people who uh, would write a handwritten note and deliver a loaf of bread to people after they had come to our church for the first time. And, and that was the person who was responsible for following up with folks. And it was another way of helping people. And when we would talk later about, um, about what, what was the thing that helped them feel welcome more than anything? I mean, I, I, hope they, I hope they enjoyed the coffee, but what they talked about 
was um, the bread that was delivered and the fact that this member of the congregation was taking the time to reach out and try and and get to know them and um, help them to feel like they were welcome in our place. So, oops, let's see. This has been a, 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 a <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right adjective, a difficult and challenging season for us as church. And I think that there are things that it has taught us. And so I wonder if you all would enter into the chat what this season of life in our, in life, but also in the life of the church, has taught us that we have to let go of in order to be able to offer a generous invitation and welcome. What do you think in the life of the church that we have had to let go of in this time? Ah, TJ, Father TJ, the way things were, absolutely, wasn't even an option. What else? What have we had to let go of? Ah, the idea that online church is for only the big mega churches. The feeling that the physical church is the church, absolutely. Oh, Kathy, hugs, normal communion. The idea, you know, absolutely, Janet. The idea that pretty soon everything will be back to normal. At whatever point we can go back, normal is going to be completely different. Hugs during the passing of the peace. The notion that things are ever again going to be the way they've always been. The notion that people are just going to drop into the church or to worship. Yeah, absolutely. That the building is the church. Yes, for sure. The faith community continues on Zoom. Um, St. John's Speedway. Well, Wendy, Wendy could share more about this. St. John's Speedway has been out of the building that they had known for decades and had already found a way to be church in a place that was not the church building. And I think you all have been incredibly nimble in going from um, worshiping at your new space to being able to worship online. Thank you, Father TJ. We've, we've had to figure out this, um, what it means to be a missional church. Barb, we've had to let go uh, measuring the success of a program or a ministry depending on the number of people who participate. Yeah, I think we have to let go of our whole lot of our ideas about what success looks like. Yeah. Uh, spontaneous follow-up conversations from Valeria. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of that spontaneity, we don't have it in the same way anymore. Um, and so we have to seek those opportunities out. So what has this season taught us that we can try? What are the new things that it has allowed us to do? <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> yes, absolutely Zoom. So much Zoom. Live streaming and Zoom. Facebook Live and streaming and Zoom. Excellent. So trying to sh trying out some short-term experiences or experiments, excuse me, without people freaking out. Hallelujah. Amen. Absolutely. The need for calling people on the phone is huge. There are lots of different ways to connect perfect personally making individual phone calls. We can try being less formal. We can try and find new ways of meeting in person. But this has been a great opportunity to try and give up perfectionism, praise Jesus, and to be okay with things not being perfect. I think one of the things that, um, that I've realized is that, is that people's need to be with each other um, is so important and that maybe the sort of, um, you know, something being perfect is, can get in the way of that. <laughs> we can try having flexible, excuse me, flexibility and mercy for hiccups along the way, absolutely. We can try reconnecting with members who are homebound or otherwise not able to make it to a physical service. Okay, so here's that third question then. Absolutely, Pat, progress, not perfection. 
tried sharing worship with another church and another joined Zoom on two week, for two weeks. So given all of that, that we've had to let go of some stuff, we've had to try some stuff. When we think about our essential core work as church of gathering, transforming, and sending, when we think about the need to gather, what, are the, what has this season taught us that we can keep doing, that we can continue, even when we don't have to anymore? Why don't you share your thoughts on that in the chat? What are the things that even when we don't have to do these things on the other side of this pandemic, and there will be another side, what are the things that we are called to continue as we live our mission to offer a generous invitation and welcome? Conference call worship option for the homebound making online worship available and ongoing. I have to share with you all, one of the pieces of my work deals with, um, we have some data information that we call Faith X, and you know, it gives some demographic information, but it talks about um, people's propensity or willingness to use technology and worship. And I will say, I think of that completely differently now than I used to, because I used to think of like screens in the church and worship and, um, didn't think that we would be uh, a likely denomination to embody that. But what I found is that we as church have, have been really ready to use technology and worship because we hold each other so dear and the need to be together as church is so essential that I think that we will find ways to continue uh, to use technology. I don't know all the ways, but I know that we won't let that be an obstacle laser focus on helping people deepen relationships absolutely short-term experiments focusing on trying something and then yes absolutely evaluating it thank you still connecting with each other by zoom mm -hmm. i was thinking earlier today about the fact that last week we had 76 people um, gathered for ken and stephanie speller's uh, uh, workshop on zoom and there was not a room in the convention hall last year other than the plenary room that would have held 76 people. And we are able to do that. And then we have the recording. So anybody who wasn't able to make it there last Wednesday um, will be able to watch the recording from Canon Spellers. This week we have two workshops happening at the same time. And I know that I can go watch Brendan and Holly's workshop tomorrow when the recording is ready. We would not have been able to do that. On October 28th, we're going to have four workshops all happening at the same time. And we will have all those four recordings as a resource. There are more people here right now than would be in an average workshop in person. And the people who would have gathered in person would all very likely, or mostly very likely, have been delegates, alternates, and clergy. And what I'm really delighted about this with, through this series is that we have made it, tried to make it just as abundantly clear as we can that everybody, everybody, everybody is welcome to take part in these. So if you talk with other folks from your churches, who are not necessarily going to be participating in convention as delegates or alternates, but they want to join the workshops, please invite them to take part. Okay. I just want to come back to this call from the rule of St. Benedict. All guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ, for he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I moved to the Diocese of Indianapolis in September of 2018, and it has been a gift to be welcomed in this diocese, and it has been a gift to be a stranger again, and to feel again what it's like to be the new person coming into established community. And I will tell you, this is an amazing diocese, and you all uh, welcome very, very well, and it's a blessing to serve with you. And one of the great blessings within that is the fact that you're willing to be curious, that you're willing to learn, that this is a season when we're all learning to try new things, and you love each other, and you love God, and you recognize our call to serve and to welcome and to gather well. Oh, I skipped a slide. So my last question to you all, is how will you live our mission to offer a generous invitation and welcome? 
what's one thing that our time together um, causes you to think about as one way that you can live into this part of our mission? Just you personally. You don't have to make a commitment on the part of your whole church. If you want to, I would invite you to have a conversation with your leadership. But in the meantime, um, and I would invite us, let's see, I'm going, oh, I'm gonna show you one more thing and then I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and we'll come back together so we can see each other. Here are some resources. If you did not have a chance to watch the video, there was some pre-work included. It's fine if you didn't watch it, but if you wanna learn more about this model, the College for Congregational Development has some trainings that are available online until the day. Again, we've had to adapt with CCD as well. Um, you'll be able to watch the full training on this uh, taught by my friend Chris Cron. Um, Gather, Transform, Send is on this YouTube link. Um, we also have the College for Congregational Development website is cdcollege.org. And the tentative dates, we are waiting for full confirmation, but it looks like the tentative dates for our God willing in person gathering for CCD training, College for Congregational Development training next summer, I anticipate will be July 18th through 24th at Waycross. If you're interested in that, please email me and I will send you a confirmation just as soon as I have those dates for sure. But please save the date for now if you are interested in taking part. And I am going to stop sharing. Kristen, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Would you, I was trying to find a pencil to write down those dates. Right. Would you mind giving them to me and get to us again? I will be happy to. Yes, July 18 to 24. And that is 99.7% certain. But I'll tell you when it's a full 100%. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. So what's, the, what's one thing that our conversation this evening causes you to think about in terms of how you can live our mission to offer a, and extend a, a generous invitation and welcome. I'd love to hear from you. Just unmute yourself and let me know what you're thinking. Well, I wrote in, I, I wrote it in checks. That's what I thought we were supposed to do, but. Um, oh, tell me with your voice. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> I will. Um, I don't know how to do our website. Ah. We, we are so teeny tiny that we only have, you know, two or three people that are kind of running things. Mm -hmm. And so there's not a lot of time to train other people to do. So you're um, overloading your plate. Mm -hmm. So I would like right. to learn how to do our website. Wonderful. What else? What's one thing that you're going to do to live our mission to offer a generous invitation and welcome? I can post on our Facebook page and I realize I have to study it, but I believe we don't, haven't shared a lot that we are worshiping in person. Yeah. So I think we should put that in every Sunday, before Very every Sunday. Very good. And how people can find their way to you. Excellent. Somebody else, what's one thing that you can do to offer a generous invitation and welcome? Doesn't have to be huge. Oh. I like the idea of having a hard time um, hearing you. Yeah, having a, having a hard time with the uh, instructions. Mary, I'm having a hard time hearing you. So why don't you put that? Yeah, I have a bad connection. Yeah. Okay, well, thank um, you. Can you enter that into the chat since we aren't able to hear you? Thank you. Putting for meeting on. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of our more uh, technologically savvy members uh, call or on a couple of occasions drop by and help people get online, get cameras running. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. figure out how to how to even get there basically orienting they're orienting mm -hmm. that's fantastic thank you two more people tell me what you're gonna do if we, we have more signs, games. we need signs at church you have signs so at we, church huh? we, we need signs at church on how to find us online and at the park Absolutely. if people walk by they can't find us 
See, that's really, that's hugely important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Janet, were you going to say something also? Um, you know, the next time we have, or in the future when we have meetings in the parks, which uh -huh. we've been doing, you know, invite a friend to go along. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Wow. Stay in phone contact with members, particularly members who are not able to access us virtually mm -hmm. or are a little trepidatious about uh, using a computer. Stay yeah. in phone co contact because we have some lonely members in our church and they need to know we care. Absolutely. That's wonderful, Sandy. Thank you. Well, um, so I want to return to the questions that you raised in the chat at the very beginning, a question and a thing that you were hoping to learn at the beginning of our time. How do you feel about those questions now? Do you feel like you have a sense of something practical that you can do to help offer a generous invitation and welcome, something to think about in terms of your own place? Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any questions for me about the material we covered this evening? I'm looking for hands and not seeing them. Yeah, Gail. Just quickly, uh, will this, I joined a few minutes late, I apologize, but will the slides in the presentation be available for us to see? And you mentioned yeah. Stephanie Sellers' presentation also could be viewed. Can you tell us how to access that? Yes, so Stephanie Speller's uh, video actually came out in the newsletter today. So if you received the diocesan newsletter, it's in there. If you didn't receive the diocesan newsletter, I invite you all to please sign up. It's something that we have for everyone. That's another way of orienting to our life as diocese. So you can go to our diocesan website and there's a drop down menu under news and there's newsletter sign up there. Um, it's also on our YouTube page and so, and it's also on our diocesan Facebook page. So it's available in all of those places. This, uh, we are presently being recorded right now, and this recording and all of the other workshops uh, recordings will also be available on our YouTube page and on our Facebook page, the Diocesan Facebook page. Thank you, Becca, for helping people um, be able to find that. Uh, and if you just, if you would like the presentation itself, um, email me and I'll be happy to send that to you. I'll be happy to share that with you. Okay. And you can find my email, anybody who, who has more questions or would like to talk more about this, um, you can email me. My address is uh, on the website. Um, my last name, white, like the color, at indiedio.org. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I hope it was helpful to you all. And I love talking about this. So I would love to talk more. If any of you have any questions and you'd like to have a follow up conversation, I'd be delighted to do that. Um, one of the things that was my first role in the first church that I served, all well, these many years ago, was to be in charge of the newcomer ministries. And so I've been working on this for as long as I've been a priest. It's my fa one of my favorite, favorite things to do. And if your church would like to work on something related to newcomer ministries, please invite me. I would be delighted to come talk with you if you're interested in exploring something or thinking about how it works for your church. Glad to come talk with a newcomer ministry team or a vestry or whatever, whatever configuration of folks would like to do this. I think it is um, really important to the life of our, of our own congregations and the life of the wider church that we extend a generous invitation and welcome. So thanks for your time tonight. Um, let's pray before we say goodnight, shall we? The Lord be with you. <sighs> Oh God, for you, we are never strangers. We are always, always invited, always, always welcomed. And so help us to recognize the gift that we have in you. Help us to extend that same generosity in love to those who are already a part of the body of Christ that is your church and to those who would seek the gift of your love and your grace within Christian community. Help us lower the threshold when people are seeking to know more about us. Help us to look outward rather than only inward. 
Help us to be curious and to be willing to try, knowing that we won't always get it right, but that we love each other and we love you. So help us to love you always and to love one another always and to live generously as a testimony to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Good night.